Good morning, everyone. This is Kate O'Malley with the California Healthcare Foundation. I just want to welcome all of you to the Pulse e-registry vendor webinar. And I just want to mention to you that all the lines that we're using are muted at this time. We are recording this session so that any colleagues who may have wished to join but this time was not convenient can come back and listen to this uh, once we post it in the next day or so. We will have plenty of time for question and answer at the end of the presentation. There are two ways that you can let us know you want um, to have a question or a comment. There is a raise your hand uh, mechanism on the GoToWebinar site. You can also use the question box, and when we see questions in the question box, we will read them out loud uh, for everyone and then, um, and then share, share the answers with the group. And um, Lauren, I'm trying to advance my slide. Uh, if you click, try and clicking on. I hit the down arrow. Thank you. Um, the agenda for today is our project team introduction. We're going to talk a little bit about the project background do a very brief introduction on what is what are physician orders for life-sustaining treatment or pulse, and then talk about the technical requirements for the RFP, the process to respond to the request for proposals, the key date, and then time for Q&A. Next slide. So our project team, we are, um, we are providing oversight, direction, management, and for this team, we have uh, three organizations involved. There's the California Healthcare Foundation, um, and on that team, we have Sandra Shuley, Katie Rodriguez, and myself, Kate O'Malley. We also have two consultants working with the foundation, John Weir, who is our technical consultant, and Valerie Steinmetz, who's the project manager for this pilot project. We're also joined by representatives from the California Emergency Services Authority. We have um, Howard Backer, Dan Smiley, Sean Trapp, Priscilla Rivera, and Jim Gable working with us on this. And then we have uh, representatives from the Coalition for Compassionate Care of California, Judy Thomas and Kelly Quill. Next slide. So just by way of background, uh, just might be interesting for, uh, for the group to know that the California Healthcare Foundation has been actively supporting health awareness in the state starting um, uh, in 2007, working primarily with the Coalition for Compassionate Care, who's our key grantee in the state, who's really been coordinating a lot of the activities, including the statewide Pulse Task Force, which is a very large umbrella organization that brings together many stakeholders who have an interest in Pulse awareness adoption and, and the uh, appropriate use of Pulse in the state. We've also worked a lot with local Pulse coalitions. California is a very big state, and we have worked with them to uh, make sure that we are working locally uh, with important groups to um, to have to know understand health and, and health of its adoption in the healthcare system. Um, we looked in 2012. We did a uh, statewide survey in the healthcare system with hospitals, nursing homes, residential care facilities, uh, and we found a very high awareness and adoption of the pulse paradigm. And the coalition has had a very active training program for healthcare professionals to understand the use and application of pulse in the state and has trained close to a thousand healthcare providers on how to help other healthcare providers understand the use of pulse. And in 2014, we did a readiness assessment in the state of California to look at how close we were to being able to put a registry um, in the state to really allow the kind of access we feel is the next step for pulse development in the state. And moving forward with Pulse in California, in October 2015, a bill authorizing 
a pilot project was um, was signed by the governor, identifying identifying emergency medical services authority as the lead um, state agency. And in March, as you know, the California Healthcare Foundation released a request for proposal looking to pilot test uh, an electronic registry with a technology platform. And then in July of 2015, pending the California Healthcare Foundation board approval, we anticipate moving forward with a pilot project in the state. So just so just for awareness, you know, uh, we we learn a lot in the implementation of a registry effort from the efforts of our colleagues in Oregon who have been operating a registry for the past five years. And they've been able to look at the impact of having the voluntary completion of post forms in the state and really looking at um, the uh, location of death for people in the state of Oregon over a two-year period and finding the impact of having a pulse form completed in the registry and the impact that it has on the eventual location of death of these 18,000 people in Oregon who died. And as you as you look at the bottom, the bottom going from the bottom up, if a person completed a poll form that looked for comfort measures only, and there were close to 12,000 of them, only 6% of those people died in the hospital. If there, uh, if a person with serious illness completed a poll form looking for limited treatment, and there were about 5,000 of those individuals, only 22% of them died in the hospital. If there was no post form in the registry, 34% of those individuals died in the hospital. And if the post form identified full treatment and there were 1,100 individuals with those uh, signed forms, 44% of those individuals died in the hospital. So you can see a, a clear correlation between establishing healthcare wishes, identifying the intensity of care, and actually looking back then at where was the most intensive care received people who wanted full treatment but the most intensive care, people who were looking for comfort measures, got intensive comfort measures but not did not die in the hospital. Next. This is what uh, the post forum uh, in California looks like. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to take a look at this and see the data elements that are on the form. This is a form that is um, managed by the Emergency Medical Services Authority uh, in California, and this uh, is the form that we'll be working with as we look to your help and support in translating the information on the written form into electronic format that can then be stored in and um, easily retrieved. And um, at this point, I would like to um, turn the rest of our conversation and discussion over to John Weir, who is the Foundation's um, technology consultant on this effort. Great. Thank you, Kate. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning, or this afternoon, I should say. And just uh, real quick, uh, we, have, we released the, the RFP um, just over a week ago. and. Uh, we're looking to give about a, a month's time frame for responses. We know there's many moving parts um, to this project, and uh, we want to give uh, responders uh, sufficient time to uh, you know, put together a, a very thoughtful and detailed response um, for consideration um, by the evaluation team. So we're looking at the process of uh, getting Q&A after today's meeting and following up by March 28th with uh, distribution of uh, responses to the, the questions that we received today uh, on the website where folks were able to download the uh, RFP, <clears throat> excuse me, post them on March 31st. Um, responses due on April 15th and uh, during the course of the, the following month, three, three to four weeks, we'd then be going through the process of uh, identifying uh, different vendors to speak with, uh, evaluating those responses, and narrowing things down to a vendor of choice being identified by May 12th, um, based on the current timeline. And then, as Kate previously mentioned, pending board approval, um, an award would be granted uh, somewhere in the July 1st time frame, uh, based on uh, that board approval. Next slide, please. 
I have it actually. So the uh, the Pulse Pilot community, and we we embedded this table within the RFP, and uh, it's really just a, an example um, to give organizations a guideline as to the types of provider organizations that would be involved at the community level, and the uh, organizations um, involved, and also the volume of anticipated uh, post forms that we would we we're imagining for a typical. Uh, community and I'm, I'm going to focus mostly down in the bottom of this particular slide I think everything else is relatively self-explanatory and um, but you can see that the annual estimate um, is a fairly sizable range anywhere between 2,500 to 10,000 completed uh, polls forms and so you, you know in the, in the responses um, we want folks to, to kind of come in around the middle of that and uh, Hopefully, there's enough information here for organizations to, uh, you know, think about what it's going to take and from a software perspective to handle handle that type of volume. It's not vast amount of volumes by any means, and uh, you know, but one of the one of the, the things we want to think about up front is uh, preloading, for instance, and uh, making sure that there is pulsed form data in the, the registry before we actually roll it out live to uh, organizations to start viewing. And so just considerations around uh, individual pulse uploads versus batch uploads might be useful if you're thinking about ranges and volumes. As far as stakeholder use of, of the, uh, the pulse registry, um, what, what we have really uh, thought of here w was narrowing it down to a specific audience. So we're aware that um, there's, there's a variety of different audiences at both input pulse, access pulse, and for uh, various reasons. And uh, the, the components you see here in the yellow section are really where we're focusing on for the, the core of the project. So skilled nursing facilities, EMS, fire service, ambulance services, and hospital emergency departments and will really be the crux of this particular project. However, that's not to say that hospice, hospice acute care, assisted uh, living residences, and primary care providers may not may, may be involved, and, and that's going to be uh, dependent upon the community responses and what we see. But for the purposes of evaluating the Pulse initiative um, that, that we're looking at, that really the top three will be the core of the user base that we are anticipating. And so under the technical overview, um, <clears throat> let me go back one slide. There we go. Sorry about this. Previous slide. Okay, so the technical overview, as you, every, as everyone's seen in the, in the uh, RFP, we're really looking at this as from a modular perspective, and, and uh, you know, we we know that there's likely no no one size fits all, um, for, from a technology perspective, and so we've looked at it from the perspective of uh, input module, processing and storage module, and really kind of the guts of the registry being in that center part, and then the pulse retrieval module. On the in component, in input component, um, we're really looking at uh, ease of manual use of, of Pulse. We know it's a data form uh, or a form, and uh, we want to be able to take those forms, receive them by fax, paper, email, mail, and then process them electronically um, to some consumable form using some consumable format: HL7, XML, JSON, CDA. And by and and get it stored in the uh, the registry, and the push of that information will will involve two things: pushing uh, either an image or a PDF file up to the the uh, the registry, and being able to interpret the the handwritten or typed data that's in the pulsed form, so that we can perform matching <coughs> uh, of of the uh, patient information, um, in the in the processing of the the pulse forms into the registry. Uh, 
pre-validation um, is one of the things that we're, we're considering as well and uh, making sure that the post forms are complete, that all sections do have a response in them and before they're pushed up as a, as a means of pre-processing and, and uh, you know, reducing the potential for error. Um, we also are looking at a component in, in the bottom left-hand side of the screen here to have a, an administrative section for post uh, manual user entry or updates uh, you know, to aired information that would be handled by uh, administrative staff um, during the course of the project. So the ability to have a web form for direct, direct data input um, so that if there's any aired files, we can you know, update fields that may be associated with those, those files and, uh, and then push that data into the, uh, the registry. And also uh, providing uh, reporting on the input side and whoever you know, comes to the table with that input component, be able to provide some reporting metrics around uh, you know, where, where source data is coming from, the volume of source data, and other uh, reporting requirements that we'll, we'll work through during the course of the, uh, the implementation process. As far as the registry itself, um, you know, we're looking at it to be a highly secured cloud-based model, so uh, HIPAA compliant, high trust compliant. And uh, from an authentication perspective on the input side, we're looking to, uh, and the output side for that matter, we're looking to uh, have authentication happen at the entity level. So organizations that may be pushing data to or, or retrieving data from the registry um, should be able to do so at the, at the entity level and therefore reducing the, the, the amount of user management within the registry itself. And patient matching. Uh, is obviously a huge concern to us and uh, making sure that we do have a high level of patient matching of pulse forms um, in the registry is an absolute must. And we are looking to vendors to come to us and uh, give us recommendations around probabilistic or deterministic matching and uh, we're looking forward to getting you know, feedback from uh, the respondents as far as uh, what may be the best course of action there. Um, validation of forms at the registry, and um, we are seeking uh, recommendations from vendors as far as uh, data validation. I, I know that there's uh, the California Death Registry, there's uh, the National MPI uh, Registry uh, for Physician MPI numbers, and we are looking to, to be able to use mechanisms such as that or other recommended mechanisms for the purposes of uh, validating data within the post forms and we look forward to uh, uh, seeing what folks have in those responses. And then once the post form is in the registry and we want to be able to have the ability to manage updates and maintain convert, uh, version control and so that there's only one current and valid uh, post form at any given time. However, we do want to retain historic copies for the purposes of audit tracking and uh, you know, looking back at, at historic uh, forms on, a, on an exceptional or as needed basis. The access to those archived forms will only exist for administrative users and therefore at any point in time um, administrative staff, if they receive a call, they should be able to look that up um, as needed. As far as outbound, information and we are looking uh, at tr trying or tr trying to look at this from a perspective of what or what do organizations currently have uh, access to that pulsed forms may be, but be, be able to utilize from a push perspective and that was one of the reasons why we're looking at EPCR and, and hospital emergency departments and you know there's pre-existing systems we, we know they work and we know that they may be capable of receiving uh, post forms and we know that there's going to be some data modeling involved and, uh, and then interfacing so uh, we're looking to uh, vendors to be able to uh, come back to us with information associated with the extraction of the post data and what data formats you would uh, be looking to use for the, for the
for those purposes and what secure data transfer mechanisms you would be using um, to, uh, to give access to the, uh, the acute care environment or emergency medical services environments, accessing those, uh, those forms. Uh, as far as uh, authentication of systems, again, we're looking at uh, entity level uh, authentication as opposed to individual user level authentication. And this may be where, uh, you know, organizations interacting with a, interacting with a health information exchange, for instance, may, uh, you know, be able to come to the table with some creative uh, thoughts around uh, the, the authentication process. Uh, we do want to uh, look at single sign-on capabilities um, via the applications that would be uh, in use in those, those um, organizations, uh, emergency departments, EPCR users, and uh, looking to get some information uh, from organizations around the use of SSO SAML 2.0 and uh, how uh, straightforward or not so straightforward that may be to uh, implement for the purposes of this project. And there should be a, a patient search capability um, in uh, the administrative web form, um, and that's got represented down in the uh, the bottom right hand side here on the diagram. Uh, the web portal should have, uh, similar to the input piece, there should be an administrative option for access um, into the registry and for on-call, on-demand uh, access or emergency access to Pulse forms via uh, telephone operations group and that would be uh, provided um, by the project team and during the course of the, the, the uh, pilot project. And again, on the output side or retrieval side, and we would also be looking at reporting capabilities and that can track volumes, uh, utilization by entities, retrieval time metrics, um, and the likes that would help us um, during the evaluation of the, the success of the project uh, bring together some statistics that will uh, be useful as we uh, finalize the uh, the reporting from the pilot. On the implementation requirements, um, just a couple of quick points here. Um, on the implementation side, uh, everything's relatively self-explanatory, I think. You know, project management, training, integration, um, user acceptance testing, go live and roll out support. And so we want to get a, a good picture of what an, implement, what an implementation timeline would look like and what resources will be coming to the table and to assist with the implementation process. And also on an integration level, understanding you know, the costs per connectivity and for uh, integration to uh, different parties especially on the retrieval side. On the operations and support side, um, breaking things down um, into the, uh, the, the six components you see here. Um, just a couple of points on, on the operations and support side. As I mentioned uh, a moment ago, we will be uh, supplying uh, a partial FT, FT access and to uh, telephone uh, operations, telephone call center type of environment, so we don't anticipate that being in any of the responses. Um, we uh, are very focused on understanding what the service level agreement commitments are and uh, making sure that from a, from a hosting perspective that the uh, security and technology uh, realm is, is nice and tight and uh, that any uh, uh, data recovery processes are, are, are uh, aligned with uh, what potential state requirements may be down the road. From the evaluation criteria perspective, we have weighted the, uh, the budget as the heaviest component, and followed by the, uh, the solution itself, solution capabilities, and with uh, the, the next level of weight. And vendor experience with health IT solutions and proposed delivery process um, carries less weight, but we are looking um, to, to gain a, a solid understanding and responses of what folks' experiences are with Pulsed and, uh, and uh, how that ties into the, uh, the data interoperability component that we're looking at here and with the registry. And from a pilot project timeline, 
uh, just to give you an outline of what we're looking at over the three plus years per, uh, timeline. Uh, July 2016, assuming um, we, we get award um, in a timely basis in July, we'd be looking at kicking implementation off um, July through S December of, of this year. And that would be uh, inclusive of, of getting the community stakeholders engaged, working through the technology uh, implementations and data integration, uh, doing some initial connectivity testing and preparing for Go Live, um, which would take place in early 2017. Uh, 2017, uh, January through June 2018, uh, we'll then commence the data collection and evaluation process. And so from a vendor perspective, that really means just making sure that the, the system has appropriate uptime. We have the, the appropriate level of go live support <coughs> and, uh, and assistance with any reporting or metrics that's needed during that period of time. And then access to uh, you know, ma uh, you know, maintenance uh, software support is needed and during the, the same period. Moving into uh, July 2018 to July, uh, sorry, December 2019. Again, similar uh, similar activities, just uptime on the system, support and maintenance of the system, and um, while we go off and we complete the uh, the documented evaluation process, it would be, then be presented to the state um, for any future action. I think there's a little delay with the slides for me. Okay, here we go. So on the initial FAQ, um, just a, a few bullets here. I'm not necessarily going to go through them. They'll be available in the recording for folks to to look at. And you know, we will uh, su submit this uh, to the website and uh, make sure they're available within a couple of days. Um, one question uh, in particular I want to address in today's call is what will happen at the end of the pilot project. And uh, really the pilot project is, uh, is the, the means of us uh, looking at building a business case that, and a sustainable model that could then translate, uh, tr transition into a, from a pilot in a community to a statewide model. So keep that in mind. And we are uh, somewhat dependent upon uh, state feedback as far as that transition in uh, 2019, late 2019, to early 2020, um, and uh, you know our evaluation and success criteria will really drive where that goes to. And at this point in time, I'm going to open it up for questions. So Lauren, I, I know there's a lot of questions, but I'm not necessarily able to see them in my pain. Uh, it, it doesn't seem to want to expand. So, so one question is, how closely do you want the form to model on the existing form? So we want to be able to take the existing uh, pulsed form, and perhaps with modifications in the uh, in the pilot community only for now. And we recognize that today's uh, California uh, pulsed form may not have sufficient uh, data elements to uh, boost the matching capabilities to the level that we may 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 need um, for the purposes of using this registry. And that's something that EMSA, California Healthcare Foundation, Coalition for Com Compassionate Care of California, will be uh, taking to a work group and uh, and and working through um, in the in the next couple of months. However, as it stands today, we do want uh, the form um, to to remain intact and and uh, be modeled on on what you see today. So uh, that was from Jonathan Fight. Um, Hopefully that helps. Uh, next question, um, again from Jonathan, how much would you like to be able to extract individual data elements from the pulsed form? In other words, if we can present an interactive paper document, would that be of interest or is that the whole point? Um, Kate, uh, I'll, I'll respond to that and then maybe you can follow up 
with uh, some, some additional feedback. At this point in time for the pilot project, we are really looking to take the take the pulse form as a PDF or image file and use it um, you know for storage uh, in the registry and we don't necessarily uh, other, other than being able to extract field information from the pulse form to do the matching process and storing that patient data that patient match data in the in the registry we're not necessarily looking at uh, having a, a massive amount of uh, pulsed uh, form input, uh, uh, online pulsed form input as part of this project. Kate, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, um, I would. I would. I agree with that, and I think that the development uh, and the upkeep of the pulsed form itself in California is a very large stakeholder engagement. It's been revised a few times since it um, first appeared on the scene um, in um, you know six or seven years ago. And the process of revising the form is really quite lengthy. So I think for the pilot, we may add some patient identifiers that are not presently, that are required for, um, for matching that we don't currently have. But in terms of further modifying the form and making the process an interactive online, I can see the value of that, but I think that is beyond really where we want to go in the pilot project. It may be that once we have a pilot well established, we could look at more uh, more advanced ways of capturing post information that are beyond the, the paper process. But I would say that's a little bit more advanced than what we feel we can tackle in this pilot phase. Thank you. Uh, next question was, will the sh slides be shared? Yes, they will be shared on the uh, on the website uh, link uh, where you pulled the RFP. And also, uh, just to add to that, we're also recording this. Um, so slides and the recording and the Q&A will all be available. Great. Next question, can you provide a range of expected budget assuming board approval? Are we talking 50K, 500K, 2 million? Um, any, any range would be uh, useful. Okay, any thoughts? Um, yes. So this, this, for people who may have um, responded to a previous request for information that we actually fielded towards the end of 2014, early 2015, um, we did get some very, very interesting uh, responses to that and some very broad price ranges that were from a half million dollars to you know in the in the millions of dollars to create software to capture poll registry data in California. So we we're pretty sure that the California Healthcare Foundation Board does not have a multi million dollar appetite for this particular work, it, in, especially since we're just going for pilot support at this time. So I, you know, I I'm reluctant to to really um, to to I'm reluctant to drop a big net around this from a cost perspective. But you will notice that 50% of the criteria for thinking who would be our most likely uh, successful candidate is a cost evaluation. So um, it's not fifty thousand dollars. I can certainly tell you that. Um, and but it's also not a multi-million dollar project and that's another reason why we selected the modular approach in not really looking to support a lot of original software development for this effort so i you know i'm i'm reluctant to say anything to make you think that we definitely have a number in mind because we don't have a number in mind but the number you could keep in mind is that we really want to have a um the, you know the the a lean and agile approach to this particular work that doesn't involve a lot of original, any original software development, the connectivity of existing work that we're hoping to support. And with that, we hope we will see a reasonable cost for a pilot and then subsequent to that, a reasonable cost for a statewide spread. And John, feel free to elaborate on that. Certainly, yes. Thanks, Kate. And and uh, I think just to piggyback on, on a couple of Kate's comments, um, from from a from a perspe technology perspective, we are really looking for organizations to come to us with uh, 
tools that that exist today that, that are in production today and, and being used with the understanding that while the, it may not be a holistic off the off the shelf uh, product and there will be data modeling involved there will be workflow configuration involved and and really kind of looking at those two areas and and, and, and obviously interfacing involved in development around that. But those three areas are really where we, we want to focus um, you know, s some of the budgetary items and not in uh, kind of development projects um, from scratch um, or far from it. So I, I think that's, that's a really important point you, you brought up, Kate. I just wanted to kind of iterate it to an extent. So. Uh, next question. Uh, the RFP states that the California Healthcare Foundation um, seeks to purchase an electronic pulse to e-registry platform model. Does that does a license to access a cloud-based system satisfy the requirement? Yes. So we're we're anticipating that uh, there would be a license fee or a software uh, subscription fee model um, as part of the uh, the, the, the software uh, use agreement. Kate, do you have any additional thoughts on that? No, that's that's okay. Fine. Great. Uh, next question. Not sure what you mean by matching the pulse to patient information. So. Uh, Patient matching, so we're going to be receiving the pulsed form and it will contain the, uh, the, the patient data within it. We also need to, t to interpret that data, that patient data, in order to push it into the pulsed database and, and store it in that registry. So uh, we, we want to, and once that patient is in the registry, we want to be able to receive updates um, in a similar manner. So in order to do that, uh, we need to be able to, to match certain key identifiers um, against the data that would it then exist in the, in the Pulse registry to maintain the updates and versions of the uh, Pulse form against that patient. I, I hope that answers the question. Uh, do you have a preference between web forms, paper scans, and, and faxes? In other words, isn't the goal to get away from paper, scan, fax, and what are the security methods that you wish or expect to have in place with respect to secure email? So to answer the first point of that, um, yes, uh, ideally we would love to get away from paper and fax. However, we do know that uh, paper paper faxes um, are, are commonly the, the most used means of, of getting the, the pulse forms today and um, over time that may change but that's that's kind of where we're going at, at the moment we do want to digitize those paper forms and get them into the, the database obviously and um, but without the use of online forms so uh, that's why we're looking at the conversion from paper to PDF for example and from uh, a secure email perspective and we would be looking for the, uh, the vendors to come back to us with uh, some type of capability that will offer secure email back to uh, the, uh, the patients or the patient's uh, legal decision maker, uh, providing them with notification that, uh, that the pulse form was received and stored in the registry. Um, that will go to the, uh, the individual's uh, email address given um, in, in, on the post form. Um, as far as secure email uh, for, on the input, um, again, um, we're looking for recommendations from, from the vendors as to what uh, secure mechanisms um, you have working today that can be transitioned over for the use of POST. care or want to have external email clients be used or can users be required to securely log in to, in order to send messages? 
I'm not quite sure I understand this particular question. Um, we, there, the only messages, so the the, the message, the only messages that would be sent would be the the notification of uh, automatic notification that a post form was uh, entered into the registry, being sent to the uh, patient or the patient's uh, decision maker. Um, that would be going to a general inbox, so it could be anything from Google Gmail to Yahoo Mail, and depending upon what the uh, the patient or decision maker provides um, within the post form. Are you open to biometrics as a method of validating ID? At this time, I don't. Well, uh, on the retrieval side, yes, that that is possible. Um, and again, that that would be individual based authentication that would then have to be taken care of at the entity level before the pass through to the Pulse registry. So assuming on the, the it would depend on the capabilities uh, on the retrieval side of things and how users are authenticating themselves within the walls of the entity within which they work and how that entity then reaches out for a Pulse form, <coughs> either through themselves or through an HIE to the registry to pull down that data. And so if biometrics is, is a mechanism in place, absolutely you can use it um, so long as we get authentication from the entity. Are you interested in using methods such as strong ID as defined by Commonwealth for ID validation and matching? Um, yes, we are interested in it and we would welcome um, feedback from you and the responses associated with that. Can you speak to offline access needs? So uh, offline access needs, um, that's where the, uh, the call center or operations center uh, component comes into play. And um, we know given the volumes of, of Pulse forms that we're talking about that it's going to be a partial FTE type of uh, uh, scenario. Um, however, we would be looking at 24-7 access um, to that. We don't, and so from an offline perspective, I'm treating this question as offline as in the end user, still having access to someone who can tap into the, uh, the registry for the purposes of viewing the post. There'd be a common phone number that would be granted and that those users could call into the post center uh, to, to make the request for access to a, uh, a patient's data. They would be uh, required to identify themselves. <coughs> Excuse me. They would be required to identify themselves, and you know, using uh, requirements that we will be defining during the course of the next couple of months. Can you speak to the relationship between this project and other EMSA initiatives, um, such as HIE, pre-hospital, safer? Uh, Jim, uh, Jim Switz Gable from EMSA is on the phone, and perhaps maybe Jim, you could respond to that question. Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, at this time, it is not uh, directly tied to those other projects. Um, while while in the future there could be a relationship, but there is no relationship at this time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see. Uh, do, next question is, do you have a preference with respect to organizations' backgrounds, e.g. general IT development, HIE, EPCR, et cetera? What background or set of backgrounds do you think would be most helpful or does it not matter? Uh, well, from, a, from a background pr perspective, and Kate, please uh, piggyback on my comments here. Um, we are looking for for organizations that do have experience in healthcare, um, ideally with uh, some Pulse experience. Although we know that uh, technology in Pulse is not a, a wide span uh, thing at this time. So, you know, the ability to move data around, understand uh, data security and registry operations all come to the table from the perspective of, of what we're looking for in this particular project. And that's, you know, we're, we're not necessarily looking at it from a, an HIE perspective, uh, EMR vendor perspective. I think it's kind of more uh, broadly based as far as capabilities. 
and uh, and and experience in the field with regard to uh, managing data, moving data, and making data available to end users. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I would agree with that, John. And I would also add that um, it, it's uh, w workflow in the clinical setting. You know, will be an important consideration for the technology vendor to understand the, the challenges of that. We'll be working in the pilot site with um, skilled nursing facilities whose familiarity with the broader range of um, electronic health records and computer access in general may not be as advanced as other parts of the healthcare system, but they're key players in terms of the completion and the delivery of full forms into a registry and so um, and other settings as well. So I think having having an ability to appreciate the challenges of workflow for multiple levels in the healthcare system would also be an attribute. Great, thank you. Next question is, please discuss your expectations of vendors' responsibilities to engage community stakeholders before the award, i.e., do you have specific locations in mind, or should vendors be suggesting them or bringing them to the table? Um, and this, this just happens to be our currently last question also. Um, I think, uh, Kate, uh, you know, we, we don't have any specific expectations of vendors to be interacting with uh, communities prior to uh, to award. However, if uh, a vendor is responding and has a community in mind and that community is also uh, looking at responding to the recently posted community RFP um, for a pilot site, um, I, I, it would be very interesting to see that, that collaboration and, uh, and, and how that would work. Um, so please, yes, I would. I would. Yeah. I would agree. I mean, we don't yet know who, obviously, on the vendor side is going to find this uh, timely and appealing. We don't yet know on the community pilot or the system pilot site the same. So we certainly wouldn't presume to do any matchmaking. But if there, you know, if there was an opportunity to at least have some synergy between two efforts. Um, we'd be certainly interested in seeing that, but we didn't put it in as any kind of requirement because the ultimate selection of a test location and a vendor will not be known um, for quite some time. And, and these processes are happening in parallel, but they're not happening you know, in the same location at the same time. Great, thank you. And that uh, that brings me to the end of the questions that are posted on the uh, on the on the screen here. Um, you know, again, if you do have questions, please uh, you know go to the, the the questions window on the on the WebEx screen and, and feel free to uh, include them. Kate, while we maybe wait just a moment or two to see if there's any additional questions. Um, do you have any comments um, and any thoughts that you want to share with the vendors about the community RFP that might be useful since it was just released, I think, on Friday? Well, I think that what we're hoping to see from the response from the community RFP is really broad representation of the healthcare system. I mean, one of the, one of the criteria of the legislation that is very helpful to this process is that in the pilot locations, there's a mandatory requirement for submission of pulse forms into the registry. Now, that doesn't mean that completion of a pulse form is mandatory. That's always voluntary. But if a provider, a, a physician, a nurse practitioner, or a physician's assistant, or a member of the healthcare team helps a patient complete a pulse form, then that pulse form um, has to be submitted into the registry. And so it, it will be, for this to be successful, for this test to be successful, that we will need to be working both on the technology side in a solution that is um, implementable at the community level by a variety of vendors, I mean of, of providers to complete the pulse forms and then for us to have a good test of does the registry actually help patients get their wishes on it about intensity of care in emergency situations, we have to have a sufficient 
volume of forms going going into the cloud-based repository and have them retrievable um, by emergency responders and um, emergency rooms and ICUs at the point of care. So it's a very dynamic process, and I think you know the success of it will be in the simplicity, I, simplicity or the ease of the technology solutions, and also our ability to really engage providers in the pilot community to make sure that forms are submitted in sufficient volume that we can actually test the capabilities of the technology and then see if we can make this um, make a case for it in the evaluation and then hopefully have a statewide spread. So the synergy between the pilot site and the technology solution will be very important and that will certainly be the interest of the California Healthcare Foundation as we, you know, as we look to provide project management support and um, other types of support for this to be successful. A piece we didn't talk about too extensively right now is the um, separate evaluation effort that we will have underway as the implementation starts, both a structure uh, and a process evaluation to really see if our efforts to have pulse form submitted to a registry and access are actually meeting the needs of getting the information out of the point of care. And so an evaluation will also be a critical part um, of this effort as well. And our the responses to the the um, from the pilot site location responses are expected at the end of April. And then the foundation and our uh, work team um, project team staff from EMSA and from the coalition will have the task of reviewing and, and selecting and then making a recommendation to the California Healthcare Foundation Board in June. Did any other questions come in, John? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, we do. We have one here. And um, can you please speak to the comfort with uh, secure HIPAA compliant cloud services such as Amazon Web Services? And um, you know, we are anticipating um, you know such such services um, in the responses. Jim uh, Swiss Gable, do do you want to make any comments as far as uh, thoughts around uh, web services? Um, certainly. Um the state does um, indicate uh, within the the, the SAM, um, uh, which is available online, um, what uh, the requirements are for cloud-based services, and you know I would suggest looking at those. Um, we could reference that out on the site too, with some with some of the locations to look at. Um, but um, you know, I think if you follow those, then you're on the right track. Thank you, Jim. Uh, next question is, can you explain a bit more about e-signature? So for the purposes of, of this particular project, we're not necessarily considering e-signature as a need. You know, the pulse forms themselves will be signed, the pulse forms will be stored uh, in the registry, and, uh, and with that, the signatures will be on those, those, uh, those files. And so we're not necessarily looking at e-signature as an absolute requirement um, for the purposes of this particular uh, pilot initiative. Next question is, uh, what is the pilot timeline? So uh, just going back to, to a previous slide, and um, we are looking at July 2016 through uh, end of year for implementation, all being well, uh, followed by a pilot timeline of uh, January 2017, and here we have it in front of us again. Uh, through June 2018 for data collection associated with the evaluation process. Uh, uptime on the registry will continue uh, from July 2018 to December 2019. And, uh, and during that period of time, uh, you know, there will be decisions being made as far as sustainability of the, of the e-registry at a statewide level and, uh, and how, that will, uh, how that will continue, you know, from a budget and uh, stakeholder leadership perspective post pilot. John, here's a question. I, I, the, the question box on this is a little funky, so we apologize if 
we could basically read like one line, line, one at, line a time. at a time. Right. <laughs> but here's a question. Is there a preference to translate um, paper pulse forms to PDFs electronically, such as OCR, or manually human data enter into PDF format? OCR. So we are looking to have it, you know, translated, uh, you know, via an OCR mechanism, and you know, for the purposes of being able to interpret and extract the identic the patient identification fields that we use to match against the registry, um, you know, the the file itself, the pulse form itself, should be uh, retained as a PDF or image file also. I hope that answers the question. I have another question here. You mentioned high trust certification. Is that a specific compliance requirement or does HIPAA compliance SOC 2 and 3 SSAE suffice for a cloud platform? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, High trust, high trust is is one of the considerations we're making. However, if a vendor comes back with uh, you know SOC 2 uh, compliance, HIPAA compliance, um, hopefully that's just a standard at this point in time. Uh, you know, we will consider uh, the, the specific uh, responses and what level of uh, compliance they have. Jim, do you have any additional thoughts um, associated with that question? Well, and as I said, if I, I'll, I'll look in the state uh, administration administrative manual and find the section uh, that you can reference. I'm certainly if they're fed ramp compliant, that should be just fine for us too. But um, uh, that we'll we'll get the specifics from the uh, state administrative manual. Okay. Um, next question I have is a uh, question about. Um, a point associated with insufficient data to match. Do you want supplemental data elements to be based on Nemesis version three, CCD, or something else? <coughs> Good question. And um, Jim, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, you know, I'm, I'm certainly certainly we would like to have compliance with Nemesis version three. Um, I'm I'm just not uh, clear whether that is a component of Nemesis version three or not. Um, I, I would have to go back and check that. But we'll we'll get the information and get back to you. But certainly we're all, we're looking for Nemesis version three compliant uh, where it's necessary. How many integration points should be assumed for the purposes of costing? Uh, that is a good question. Um, what we'd like respondents to do, and Kate, uh, please add on as a, uh, at the end of my comments here. I, I think what we'd like to consider is, uh, from budgetary perspective, if, if vendors can let us understand what the per connectivity uh, or integration point costs may be on a per point basis. And we will then be able to look at the communities, which we don't fully understand right now, whether it's going to be four hospitals, six hospitals, two hospitals, and likewise with EMS and, and other entities. So if we can get an understanding, even if it's a range in the per uh, integration arena, I, I think that would be the best approach um, and the responses for us at this point in time. Yeah, I I would agree. I have nothing more on that. Let's see, next question. So, so just to reassure everyone, every question that's been asked so far, we do have a record of it. And if for some reason it didn't pop up in our verbal in our conversation today, we will capture all of these questions and make a response to them and have that available on the timeline that we um, mentioned earlier in the call. So don't 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 give up if you didn't hear an answer, you will you will get an answer. Yeah. Uh, let's see, where are we on time? Um, so we got about a minute left and still got a couple more questions. And um, one question is uh, can we maintain the exact form, make it extractable? Um, absolutely. Uh, next question. 
Can you elaborate a little more on not seeking digital or electronic solutions within the uh, architecture? I, I, I think at this point in time, you know, we, we may have addressed that, um, but from, for the purposes of this project, you know, taking the, taking the Pulse form, making it electronic, um, you know, the Pulse form it already has a signature on it. Um, we don't necessarily, we don't want to make e-signature available for the purposes of, you know, easing uh, input and who has access to the input mechanisms in the registry. Um, you know, you can contact me offline if you need any kind of further detail um, as it pertains to that uh, question. Next question was, so does that mean you don't need e-signing? That's correct. Um, Follow-up question, does it mean that you're not trying to get all the information but only a handful of data fields to match it to a patient in the system? That's correct. So we, we understand that the actual uh, orders in the POLST will remain in the POLST uh, form. We're not extracting those orders um, for the purposes of storing them anywhere and re, uh, re, reconfiguring a POLST form on the output side of things. So what goes in is what's going to come out um, from an image or PDF file perspective. And structured, uh, structured data will be at the patient level only um, and not at the orders level. Uh, will EM, EMR uh, integration be required? Um, one would assume that EMR integration will be required um, dependent upon what the communities come back to us with as their, their tools of choice. But I, I would imagine that with uh, emergency departments being involved, there will be some level of EMR uh, integration involved. So uh, this is Kate. I just want to note that we are at the, the time for the end of our questions, but this is not the end of your opportunity to ask questions. If you're still on the line and you still have questions, please take advantage of the uh, ability to just write your questions to us, and um, we will happily capture them and respond to them and post those responses. And uh, with that, I just want to thank, uh, thank John and thank everyone for signing in. Uh, thank you for your interest in participating with us in developing a post e-registry in California. And uh, we look forward to uh, hearing from you in the not too distant future. Thank you very much. Thank you.